Well, welcome to our Wednesday night prayer study together. And first things first, I know everybody wants to sing together. Happy birthday to Pastor Clark. Um, go right ahead. Uh, but what I'm going to tell you, remind you that he's got eight more years before he'll be stuck on his 39th birthday. But I'm not going to tell you how old he is. Well, thanks for joining us tonight. We want to take a look at just a couple prayer thoughts. And uh, we're going to the book of Colossians tonight. So we'll be in there the next couple weeks. Colossae was a very interesting town, good size. Uh, it at one time was a pretty major commercial area, but it was on the decline, uh, diminishing skills with apologies to Bernie Kozar. But uh, at this point in time, probably around 60 AD, uh, Paul writes a letter to them. And he writes a letter from a prison. He also wrote a companion letter to Ephesus. So these two came probably together. And um, interesting to note a couple things. Ephesus was about 100 miles away from Colossae. Ephesus was on the, uh, right near the shore of the Mediterranean Sea. Colossae was about 100 miles in east of it. <clears throat> Paul may or may not have ever been there, but there's a church in Colossae. In fact, we now believe that maybe there were two or three churches, each of whom were house churches. So they probably um, kept their social distance. They were probably only 15 to 30 people in either of those house situations. Um, how did it get founded? Well, one possibility is that Colossae was in the area of Phygeria, and that is um, mentioned in the book of Acts chapter 2, that there were some people from that region that were there at the day of Pentecost. So it's very possible some of them got saved, went back home, started witnessing. That's a big possibility. Some people think that maybe he, while Paul was in Ephesus, that perhaps he either made a trip to Class A, or maybe he sent some representatives there. Either of those are possible. What we do know is that the main man at Class A was Epaphras. He was um, a great godly spiritual leader. He became the pastor of that church, at least for a while. History tells us, tradition let's say, um, that maybe Epaphras ended up being a bishop in Ephesus. Don't know that for sure. So Paul's in prison in Rome. Epaphras goes and visits him. There's some reports that maybe he got arrested while visiting too. Anyhow, he tells Paul about what's going on in Ephesus, what's going on in Colossae, and Paul writes these two letters and sends them with some other representatives to go and me with them. Paul's main purpose in writing to Colossae is because Epaphras told him about some false doctrine that was rising up. It was really a mixture of Christianity, some Judaism tossed in, a little bit of Oriental mysticism all mixed up together. And um, you and I sit here and say, how does that happen? Uh, you know, it just sounds so strange. I remember when my um, professor and good friend Dr. Wayne Beaver, who was a missionary to the Central African Republic, told us about how he went there in the 1950s and they were sharing Christ with some of the natives and they readily accepted Christ. They were just so excited about him. And then when he went and visited one of their homes, the gentleman said to Dr. Beaver, where is your statue or your idol of Jesus? And he said, I don't have one. Why you ask? And he said, because I want to put it up here with all my other gods. And, and Dr. Beaver was finally realizing that some of this was not so much a transformation break to Christianity, but they were willing to just adopt and adapt that message and say, great, it goes on the shelf with all the other things I believe. That's probably a little bit of what was happening for some in class A. So I don't want to say that the whole church was a mess. I don't think that was true, but it certainly was a concern to Epaphras. So 
<clears throat> Paul starts out writing, and as he does almost all his letters, and this is what we want to think about tonight, is he starts off with notes of thanksgiving. It's a prayer of thanksgiving. Here's what he says, um, Colossians chapter 1, verse 3, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Verse 4 says, Because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints, the faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven and that you have already heard about in the word of truth and the gospel. So that has to come to you. All over the, all over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all its truth. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who had also told us about your love in the Spirit. So it's a prayer of thanksgiving. It starts off thanking them and talking about how he gives thanks for them. Paul does that in a lot of his letters. Not all of them, but most of them start with just the, the things that I am so thankful for you for. That is a really good principle over the years to learn that if we're going to confront something, it's really good to start off with some positive reinforcement, some things that draw your hearts together so that you have the, um, the right to approach things that maybe are a little bit more negative. So he mentions to them things that he's thankful for. He talks about their faith, their love, and their hope. Their faith in Christ Jesus. They heard the word, they received the word, they believed the word. And that was obvious according to Epaphras' reports. And that they had not just a faith in Christ Jesus, but they had a love for the saints. That's what my translation says. When I looked it up in the Greek, it actually literally says a love for the holy ones. I like that because the word saints in, in modern day, even in um, previous days, a lot of times there's groups that think that there are some that are saints and some that are not. The scripture uses that phrase, the holy ones, the saints, for all believers. Everybody is in the sainthood of God when you know Christ as Savior. These are all the believers, and they had this love for them. And it sounds like these believers in Colossae were loyal. They were loyal to Jesus Christ. They were loyal to followers of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Paul will go on to talk to them throughout this letter about why they should be loyal, why they should be faithful, why they should love. One reason about Christ is that he is the creator. And he'll mention that Christ is the Savior and that Christ is our Lord. To contrast, the book of Ephesians talks about the body of Christ, the glory of the church. The book of Colossians talks about Christ as the head of the church, head of the body of, of this believers. And Paul has good reasons for doing that, because he's trying to emphasize to these Colossian believers that their faith in Christ is well placed and that they deserve he deserves that because he is the head of the body of Christ. Verse 5 mentions about the faith and the love and the hope. Faith in Christ, love for the brothers, and hope that comes from heaven. Those of you who have heard me often enough know that um, for a while I struggled with the word hope because, man, I sure hope we have baseball this summer. But how is that the same as the hope that we have in Christ? And it's not. When the scriptures talk about hope, it's talking not about a wishful feeling or thinking, but is talking about a guaranteed promise that's based on the character of God himself. The hope of heaven. There is a guarantee because Christ rose again, because he's alive today. 
there's a guarantee that we're going to have heaven at the end of our journey. We will go to glory. So this hope springs up in us and it stimulates faith and love for others. In Christ and in Christ alone, there is hope. Hope for eternity, but also hope for today. The power of the resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings is what we long to be a part of. That second half is a little bit hard, but just to know Christ and to be a part of what he is doing. Verse 6 says <clears throat> that this message has gone all over the world. Think about that. In 32 years, first generation of Christians were able to communicate the gospel of Christ to what they knew as the civilized world. That means some of the southern parts of Africa, some of the most eastern parts of the Orient, and even some of the northern parts of Europe. There were pockets of other populations that maybe existed, small ones, that they were not aware of. But this message was broadcast far and wide. It's kind of exciting. Right now we're doing a thing where um, churches are closed, but they're not canceled. We're still ministering and people are out there serving Christ and serving others. And that's going on. I read about a church in California that is a Bible-believing church. I know who the pastor is, and he's a great, godly, Bible-believing pastor. And I just heard yesterday that since they've been online exclusively, their numbers are astronomical. But the one that I really loved was that they have had over 42,000 inquiries of people who want to know Christ as Savior. What is God doing in the world? Why are we in the situation we're in now? I don't know. Is that one of the reasons? 42,000 people. Are all of them going to be believers in Christ and join us in heaven? Maybe not. But I'll bet a lot of them do. And that's a great thing that God is doing today. He is still doing a wonderful work. Let's pray together and just um, have that joyful faith in Christ that love for the brotherhood, and let's cling to that hope that we have for all eternity. Lord, thank you so much for the message that you have for us today of the greatness of the church of Jesus Christ. Even though um, the church buildings were empty, um, but the tomb is empty as well, and we know the power behind that. So thank you for uh, just the ministry that can go on, Lord, we in our church have some wonderful people who are doing some amazing things right now, and we're so grateful for that. We pray that you would empower them and that their message would be strong and go far and wide. We have other people who are really struggling, some that are isolated and very alone, some that are extremely ill. Lord, we pray that you would touch them with your presence and your power that you have so that they would have the peace that passes understanding. Thank you so much for the message of hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And Lord, may we just continue to faithfully serve and honor you to the glory of our Savior. Amen.